Uh, good morning. So uh, sorry for the technical issues that uh, we had for this session. Uh, we uh, During this session, we will discuss uh, how can AI improve access to justice? And we will introduce also the topic or the challenge justice of the feder federal AI hackathon. Uh, in order to do that, uh, it's uh, uh, my pleasure to have here uh, Marco Giacalone from uh, the University of uh, uh, Brussels, but the Flemish uh, University of Brussels. Uh, and uh, we will both uh, do a short presentation about access to justice, what exists already, what, how can uh, we use AI to have better access to justice. And because we have a little bit less time, uh, we will probably mm, present a little bit less than uh, uh, expected. So, okay. So, when we are discussing about effective access to justice, and I and I would like to underline the effective access to justice, we are. Uh, it's a very huge uh, societal challenge, and it's a very huge societal challenge not only in Belgium but in a lot of countries for several reasons. And I would like just here to focus on four reasons that are uh, that are uh, addressed most of the time. Uh, in uh, Belgium, but also in European lit literature. Uh, one is the problem to access to information. A lot of people do not know their rights and they do not know how to enforce their rights or they can use uh, uh, the law in order to find a solution or to organize some, ki some kind of dispute resolution. That's one huge problem. And there are different reasons why it's like this. Uh, one of the reasons is, of course, that one Belgian uh, uh, on 10 are today uh, functional, uh, affected by functional illiterism. And that, as such, is a, already a reason to, be, uh, to, 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 to find solutions for these people to have access to some kind of information, but not only in writing. But you have also other reasons is that it's really difficult to have access to material that explain clearly what are the rights that people have. The information is distributed in different uh, different websites. And uh, even when it's accessible, it's not uh, always accessible in plain language. The second uh, problem is the cost to go to court. Uh, we know that uh, to go to court has a, a very important cost, especially for the middle class that do not benefit from, from judicial help. Uh, and uh, it's a problem in Belgium, of course, but it's even more the, uh, a problem in, in, in other European countries or in uh, uh, Canada or in the US. A third problem for effective access to justice is about small claims, because we have small claims. When you have a small claim, you do not want to pay more than the value of the claim to go to court. And so there is also the potential problem uh, to access uh, to justice. And then here comes the question of effective access to justice. And in this context, delays in the court system are quite important. And if you take a look at the, the report 2021 of the uh, Conseil Supérieur de la Justice in Belgium, you will find that most of uh, the reclamations that were considered uh, 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 based on, 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 on valid, uh, on, on valid um, uh, basis, it's about the time that the procedure takes in order for people to have a, a, a decision uh, and to have their problem settled. So that's the, the four different aspects of uh, uh, the, the problem of effective access to justice that I would like to, to, to address. And when we, uh, we will discuss access to justice, we will not focus only to access to the court system. So you know that probably that, uh, for instance, the European Union Agency for Fundamental Rights, they, uh, in general, wants to underline the fact that access to justice does not necessarily mean access to the administration of justice. Access to justice means that you can also use, uh, of course, you can uh, have your case uh, heard in a court of law, but you can also 
uh, have access to justice through other kind of mechanism, uh, such as a national human rights institution, equality bodies, ombudsman, or uh, uh, alternative dispute resolution mechanism. So, uh, and this is something that is sometimes um, uh, not uh, not. Uh, <clears throat> not taken into account. Access to justice means access to justice through courts or access to justice through other mechanisms. So how can AI improve this effective access to justice? Uh, and how can you, can, can you use AI to address these four different causes of uh, restriction to access to justice? Uh, and I will go through not this one. Uh, so one of the way to deal with this problem uh, is of course, to try to act on delays. And in order to do that, you can use artificial intelligence in order to improve, for instance, uh, case management, uh, because it takes a lot of time for the administration of justice to process the different cases and i just would like to to show you some of the uh some of the research we have done uh already with a concrete impact in france regarding this question of how we can use ai to reduce delay uh, and in this case it's uh it concerns the cour de cassation but of course you can imagine a solution like this for for uh, other level of jurisdiction uh, and the, the thing is that when you have a, a lawyer or an attorney bringing a case in front of the Cour de Cassation, he will bring what you call a mémoire ampliatif, and then you will have uh, this mémoire ampliatif will be analyzed by the administration in order to decide who should be the uh, reporting judge. And in order to do that, I mean, it takes a lot of time for the administration to look at the case, to understand the case, and to find finally uh, in who is the the the, the right uh, reporting judge. So, what the court de cassation, the cassation have uh, asked us is to try to use uh, uh, all the data they have. That means, uh, on the one hand, the memoir ampliatif, and on the other hand, the decisions that they have taken in the past, in order to uh, automatize to a certain extent the uh, identification of the right reporting judge. Uh, and in order to do so, to do that, they provide us with a lot of decisions and with the, uh, with the authorization of the l'ordre des avocats au conseil d'état et la cour de cassation to uh, a lot of different uh, uh, mémoire ampliatif for commercial and civil uh, chambers. And what we have done is that we have annotated the decisions so that we, in order to be able to extract from the different uh, mémoire ampliatif the legal question, because basically in order to define who should be the reporting judge, you need to extract what is the legal question. And depending on the legal question, you will go for this or that judge. And the idea of annotating the decisions and the memoir ampliatif is basically to have enough information in order to do the matching and to try to automatize the matching between the judges or potential judges and the content of uh, the memoir ampliatif. So here, here you have uh, uh, basically, so it's probably not easy to read, but uh, here you have basically annotated, uh, uh, annotated decisions, and then the different legal questions that this, uh, this uh, decision of the Cour de Cassation uh, try to address. And then with this, so after having worked on the, the decision of the Cour de Cassation, we worked also on the mémoire ampliatif in order to do the matching. And as you can see, we were able to make a, a, some kind of match in the structure of the text and the way words uh, are presented between the mémoire ampliatif and the decisions. So having uh, annotated memoir ampliatif and annotated legal decisions, uh, the question was, 
how to develop a model. Uh, how to develop a model to do what? But basically, to uh, distribute the different cases uh, to the different section of the court and to identify the right uh, uh, reporting judge in this different section of the code of cassation. So in order to do that, what we have done is that to, we, we trained um, uh, a machine learning system on a data set of 123,000 uh, memoir ampliatif, a little bit more than that, that we divide into 64% for training, 16% for validation, and 20% for test. And with uh, these annotation, uh, uh, and with, with this data set, we were able uh, to, so there's a distribution regarding the different sections. And with this, uh, with this data set, what we have used is word embeddings, is a very classical way to approach this kind of problem in uh, order to be able to uh, extract all the information and to do the matching. The result of uh, this attribution task, uh, uh, we were successful in, in using different kind of models and some models are better than others, uh, but, uh, and this has improved also uh, since then. So today we are around 92% of uh, accuracy in the distribution of the, 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 the different, the different memoir ampliatif. And what is the, the, the improvement there is that you go from, so in the past was between one and three months to identify the right juge rapporteur. Uh, and no, it's eight seconds. And this is no use. So that's a way to have better access to justice, not because you do something regarding access to justice, but because you have more efficient court. Of course, in this context, we have uh, a limit. There is a limit of research, uh, especially uh, in Europe, because as you know, uh, we are divided in the world between common law and civil law countries. Uh, the common law and civil law countries are a little bit different. Uh, the way uh, the way the the legal system is working is also different. But most of the models that exist today were first trained for for, for common law. So the thing is that we need to develop more models in order to address civil law issues. Uh, and it's especially true since that in, the, in a context in which most of the countries, 60% of the countries in the world are civil law countries. And uh, uh, common law is in fact very, a very small amount of legal orders. Uh, and I think that we should not stay in a, in a situation in which we don't have uh, uh, models uh, trained only on, on, on common law. So that's why we know are trying to develop and we have a project that we start on uh, cross jurisdictional A methods for civil law court decisions uh, with four main tasks that we would like to, to, for which we would like to develop specific models uh, for civil law countries, anonymization, argument mining, predictive models and legal explainability, including the justification of decision by legal reasoning. And that is of course the, the more touchy issues uh, because it's, it's quite complex to do. Another way to, to, to act on uh, act and to have better access to justice is to work on information, to provide better information and incentives uh, for uh, alternative dispute resolution. Uh, in this context, there is a, a huge consortium uh, created by our friends uh, from the University of Montréal, uh, especially the Laboratoire de Cyberjustice. Uh, and they have a, they, this huge consortium called ACT, Autonomy Through Cyber Justice Technologies. Uh, they, in this context, the University of Montréal has developed uh, a legal chatbot. So especially what uh, they have done is that they, they, in the context of small claim, in the context of small claims regarding, for instance, dispute between landlord and tenants, uh, what they have done is that they have identified the most important reason why people complain about uh, uh, the, the most important cause for complaint uh, between in the, the 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 dispute between landlord and tenants, and they identified 
on the basis of an analysis with uh, AI system, uh, what is in general the amount of uh, money that people can get depending on the, the different the main causes of dispute between landlord and tenant. So this is an example. It happens that uh, the main the main reason in uh, uh, the in the in Quebec why people have uh, uh, dispute with be, with their landlord uh, is because there, there there are some kind of bad bags. So then, on the basis of that, you can provide information to people uh, regarding what they can expect from the court. And that would be an incentive to find a solution through extra uh, ex extrajudicial uh, mechanism. But they do not have, no, they have not done that only. They have also built this uh, justice, what they call the justice bot. Uh, and this uh, is, it's a platform that use AI to have a better access to uh, legal information uh, where you will have this information about what you can expect, but that you, with this chatbot, you can also ask in natural language uh, different kind of uh, uh, questions regarding the, the, the dispute you have, and the chatbot will try to help you to find a solution. Uh, so uh, you, the, the, this is what, what they, they, they have so far, is that you can uh, first you have a kind of uh, uh, system that will classify the different question you may have, and then depending on that you will get information. You will you have will have a, a different kind of information in order to find the right legal information explained uh, in uh, accessible language, and then uh, you may have access to. Uh, different uh, uh, um, alternative dispute resolution uh, in order to not have all the cases to go to the court system. So it's something that exists already. That's one of the important uh, aspects of that is uh, that you can try online. It's just this but. And they have so far some, some good, good, uh, good uh, feedbacks from the users. And that's, of course, a way to uh, improve access to justice because you give more better information and you try to, 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 to help uh, claimants to find a way to solve their disputes without uh, having, uh, without going to court. And then and that's my last slides. Uh, then you can also act, uh, we have discussed delays we have discussed uh the the question of uh, access to information you can also uh try to 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 try to act on costs and uh, to find specific solution for small claims well, they are both connected to some kind of economical background cost because it costs a lot of money to have a lawyer to go to court etc and small claim just because uh, the, the the value of the claim is below the, the 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 cost of uh, using a, a system to 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 settle the dispute, and for that, of course, you have already a lot of initiative, including Belgium, uh, that exists uh, in order to promote alternative dispute uh, resolution. But the problem is that uh, uh, so far, I mean, at least it's my perspective, it's not really user friendly. If you go on the website of the SPF economy, you will find, for instance, Belmet for a mediation en ligne, uh, the litige commercial, but it's it's not really easy to understand how it works. And then you uh, have some kind of model letters that are uh, badly defined or designed uh, uh, models on, on Microsoft Word that you can use, for instance, to go to the to 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 go to to have access to a judge in this case on juge de paix uh, and i think that for this kind of tools that already exist or uh, uh, ai can do better i mean you can do better you can really help more people to uh, have access to all these different uh, systems that already exist if you uh, use uh, better technologies so probably 
AI is not the solution, but it's probably also part of the solution to address access to justice because you can uh, develop better access to information. You can uh, develop a solution to have uh, less costly uh, access to court and uh, to deal with more claims. And you can also improve uh, delays in the court systems. Thank you very much. And I will uh, give the floor to uh, Marco Giacalone. Thank you, Gregory. And thank you for all of you to be here. So I just introduce you myself in uh, one minute. This is a um, small video. Check it. No? Oh, or maybe. I don't know. This is uh, uh, our research group uh, uh, website. Uh, I'm parting of a research group at VUB called Digitalization and Access to Justice. So we took uh, uh, the idea of Dike, is uh, the goddess, the ancient Greek goddess of justice. And but our intent is really working on the concept of digitalization and how can this improve and put more efficient, as Gregory was saying, the access to justice. And I'm also agreeing that uh, access to justice for me is uh, uh, access to not going to the court, but it's access really to justice. So to find a way, to find a solution, and to reach justice. In our research group at the University of Brussels, so also the Flemish side, so the, the Vrije University of Brussels, we are working on several projects uh, we are quite active on the field, and uh, what I want to present to you here is two of the projects in which we use AI, artificial intelligence, to try to improve access to justice in our small uh, uh, possibilities, but we are focusing now on uh, actually also two of the points that uh, were underlined, pinpoint before by Gregory. So one project actually is on uh, specific disputes, which ones? In the division of assets, especially when you have patrimonial law, family law, where you dispute about inheritance or uh, divorces, and uh, you had to divide the assets. Normally, these are questions that are tricky, complicated, very long, and we try to use an algorithm. Uh, it's not something that we invented, but of course, following the examples in a lot of different common law countries, for, for instance, like in US, we have like uh, uh, Professor Stephen Brams that developed one algorithm. In uh, Canada, we have uh, Ernest Thyssen that developed another one. And uh, in uh, Australia, we have John Zelesnik of developing a third. I spoke with all of them and I try also to figure it out why in Europe we never had such a thing. And then, of course, let's, if we think all common law and we are civil law, each jurisdiction, different rules, problems of trying to harmonize. And I say, okay, let's try. So let's work on something that we can work on it. We can work on something that is in common in, among all these civil law jurisdiction. The, so far it's called in English, okay, available rights. In French is like droit disponible. And on this, we can work it out with algorithms or with something else rather than just going to the court. And that's what we did. It's our first project that now we are leading not alone with a consortium of 11 partners representing six of the European member states co-funded by the European Union and it's called CREA. Uh, in CREA, what does it mean? Conflict resolution with equitative algorithm. And I say like, okay, just to show you the, uh, the acronym in another way, C could be like the cooperation between the parties are because we go for a peaceful dispute resolution in representing reaching the efficient, an efficient justice, and of course, accelerating and facilitating the access. How? So the idea, and this is where we put also the AI here, is that we try to guide the people that uh, can be people that they don't know anything about either IT, AI, or either about law. So they don't know about their rights. I don't know about what they can do. What are their chances? So we developed uh, AI chatbot 
And uh, I'm here also to presenting a bit of this chatbot because it's in theory. So we are working on it right now because this is a project that is lasting two years. We started last um, June and it will finish at the end of next May. So in May, 2024. We are working on it, but for you, I, I brought a demo with me. Of course, it's a demo that you can also find online and play online at the moment, but it's still in a beta version. So it's not really uh, working perfectly. You have to just ask certain type of questions. And of course, it's not. It's still growing. It's still a baby, but we had to give more information and let it grow. But uh, if you want to uh, see how it will uh, be, like you can, we can keep in touch, and you will see. I'm, I can assure you that in one year it will be way more functional. So the idea is that uh, this chatbot can guide the people. You can ask whatever question you want about the dispute about division of assets and how to solve it in a national or in international like cross-border dispute among European Union uh, member states. And uh, doesn't matter what you ask, the important uh, is that the, the chatbot will actually ask you your values. What is, uh, what is you really want in between all the assets that you have to divide? And once you, de you decide, once you give the, the value, he will take the value from your conversation with the chatbot and will put directly into the algorithm. So that for you, it will be very easy and very user-friendly. You just speak with the chatbot. The chatbot from the question that he's asking or from the question you are posing to the chatbot will identify the values. So what, which good is more important for you, which good is less important, and then all the values will be transferred directly into the algorithm and the algorithm will provide you a solution. This is at the moment the, the stage the current stage of CREA, so the first algorithm that we developed, and is not really user-friendly, but also why we had only two years to develop and to work also about all the legal basis. Now, in the second part of the project that started last year, we are creating this chatbot. Here I put you, since I didn't know about the connection, I just put you a few slides to show you how it works. So this is our CREA chatbot. You can see the one with the similar to a judge. And uh, the one on the right is me asking question. So for example, you can see, how can I start a new dispute? And you can see like uh, the, the idea that is guiding the person through the process. So on our website that we are creating, it will be, you can create a new dispute. So you click on dispute, then select create, and you go in the section, your disputes. So step-by-step step, you are guided through the process until like actually the algorithm will give you a solution. This solution is mandatory. No, it's just a suggestion. So it's pushing the people to try to reach an agreement among them without involving lawyers, without involving judges, just because they want to reach an agreement. Because So it's not supposed to solve all the disputes about division of assets, but only the ones that the people really want to reach an agreement and they don't need to go through all the justice procedure or like all the administrative. These are also for the people that they wanted and they wanted something right now. So people are very sure, okay, we have to do this. We want to do it. My baby, we don't know. Or maybe we say, okay, I know that if I have an issue, I have to go to a lawyer. No, it's not only that. Of course, we're not asking here to not go into lawyers, not go into judges, but just to under be more understanding that you have other chances as well. You can also use this supported by your lawyer. That's not a problem. But it's just that you have to understand that it's not only going to the judge to get something if you really want. And the AI is not asking to, we are not working on the fact that we have to substitute anyone, but we just support, empower a bit more the parties, the citizen, to know their rights, first of all, knowing, and then to empower, to be a bit more empowered to so decide, okay, I want to be also the final actor of the decision. Otherwise, it's just, I go to the judge, I give everything to the judge, the judge decides. And then you are not even, a, not even a small part of the final result. You can be, if you want. This is, for example, at the moment, the current state of this chatbot. But I think like in one year, we will show you something that is way more uh, complete. 
The other project is on another point that Gregory was suggesting, it's about the small claims. So we have a project not at, for the national, uh, at the national state, but for the cross-border disputes. So as you may, uh, may, some of you may know, there is a procedure not really used, not very used at European level. So if you have a dispute about small claim, small claim for European Union regulation, it's any dispute below 5,000 euro. So if you have a dispute below 5,000 euro with someone based in another state, then you can use this procedure. Easy example, have you bought something online recently? Maybe the seller is not here in Belgium. You paid less than 5,000, you can enter in, if you have an issue with this, it can be considered as more claims from the European small claim procedure. How does it work? Right now, you cannot believe it, but you go online, you download the form, you fill the form, you sign it, then you upload it. Then the judge can see it. Once the judge makes his own decision, he downloads the document, he sign it, and then you have this piece of paper that is your executive title. That's the current state of the procedure. So we, as VOB, with a, another international consortium uh, of, of course, all European stakeholders and uh, universities, we are trying now to do two things, actually three. So we try to analyze all the, all the um, issues related to the enforcement, and we already created a roadmap uh, easy to use it's available online on our website of this project called Scan2, Small Claims Analysis Net. It's called Chu because it's already the second part, or at the second stage, because in the first part, we analyze a bit how is it this procedure, why is failing, why is not really working. And now we are in the second stage, we are proposing solutions. So we are proposing really to digitalize it, all this procedure that I show, just show you, and to simplify it. So we try to guide also here the people, and from the very first moment that they had to identify if, is it mine a situation of a small claim or not? And then, okay, and then what are the, the chances? What are my possibilities? So first of all, we created a map like this to orientate how does it work the enforcement in every single member state of European Union, all the 27. And then, okay, we, start, we try to guide the parties to say, okay, what are the, the options? And doesn't matter what you choose, our AI chatbot will guide you and will suggest you what to do. That's what, for example, in discussion also with Gregory and other common friends, we, we get to the idea of this kind of digital journey. So it's something that we try to guide the parties from the A to Z. And then if here they go through a small claim procedure and there is a judge that is giving a verdict, the verdict will not just given to the parties on a piece of paper, but will be on a blockchain system. So it will be available for the parties whenever they need in any member states, when, when and where they need it. So these are the two current projects. And from these two projects, I want to stress a few points that they, of course, they were already introduced by Gregory, but that are for me like the the last like statement with with what I would like to close my uh, small speech small speech. So one of the most important things that AI can do to improve access to justice is really also to guide the people that they don't know don't don't have any clue about what to do and what are their chances. And this is what they, we call this digital journey. So. AI can guide the people to understand, okay, what are my chances? What are my options? And then, okay, if I want to follow option A, what should I do? And is it feasible? Or maybe I want to go for option B. And so what should I do? This is where I, we really think that AI can make the difference. Secondly, of course, can support both the parties and the professional that has to be involved. By professional, I mean lawyers, 
judges, bailiffs. So all the people that they work with this procedure, but they can facilitate, they can, so also what Gregory was saying, like when the Cour de Cassation to decide which is the juge rapporteur, from one, three months to eight seconds. This is where really we can have a big change. And we are not, you see, already going to uh, the robo judge or this like the robo lawyer, no. We're just making things that are easy, feasible, and they can really have an effect on the administration of justice. And then, of course, the idea, main point to, that also came out of, uh, out of our uh, different uh, talks is that human beings, they also have to be involved in the project, in the process of developing an AI. And with all, even after with implementation, with always feedback in order to adapt. The AI is, you have to think really as a baby that uh, you have to give the information the way we let it grow, then it can make a different impact and after effect on our lives. So that, okay, we just say, we have an AI, he will do this for us. No, it's something that can be very helpful, but we always need to be there and to give enough input in order to get some kind of result that are the most efficient for us. Thank you so much. And uh, I let before the, again, the floor to Gregory. And then if you have any question, we are both here. Uh, thank you uh, for this presentation, Marco. Uh, I just would like to, to introduce briefly the last uh, slides of the session before the discussion that we may have together mm -hmm. uh, uh, to introduce the Federal AI Hackathon of 2023, especially the Challenge Justice. So this Hackathon will take place in, in, in October uh, and uh, is organized by uh, Boza and AI for Belgium. And you have four challenges. You will have four challenges. And one of these challenges concern, uh, concern justice. The others concern finance, health and uh, the uh, SPF uh, strategy appui as such. And the challenge to uh, regarding uh, the, I mean, the, the justice challenge for this federal AI Hackathon will be exactly this point of digital journey to justice. Uh, and the idea is that uh, you will have this challenge, of course, you will have uh, different tools that will be at your, uh, that you you will be allowed to use, etc., with uh, in ideally in a collaboration between uh, people from the legal sector and people from uh, informatics. And basically, with this digital journey to justice, the idea is that people will be allowed or will be able to develop one of the three modules. These three modules, solutions regarding these three modules, but of course they can combine. Uh, the first module concerns exactly this how we can guide users to the right dispute resolution mechanism. That's, that's, that's a, a very, uh, I think, very relevant topic. The second sub challenge is provide support for using alternative dispute resolution because you have the ombudsman, the mediation, conciliation, arbitration binding third party decision, all these kind of mechanism can be used and, prob and probably uh, uh, um, users uh, and citizens can get some support in order to use the uh, alternative dispute resolution. We have seen, for instance, that to access to BellMed is quite complex. That's something that you can, you, you can make more uh, simple. And uh, last and not least, uh, model three concern provide uh, the, the, the question of providing support for having a case here in a court of justice, including and probably especially the justice of the peace. Uh, and basically, all the participants will have to, 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 to decide what kind of uh, solution they want to bring in order to address these different aspects 
of the challenge uh, of, um, um, of this challenge digital journey to justice. So stay tuned for uh, more details uh, that will be in October. We'll have a lot more information in the following months. Uh, thank you very much and the floor is yours for questions.